1. A key assumption in consumer societies has been the idea that money buys happiness. Historically, there is a good reason for this assumption, until the last few generations, a majority of people have lived close to subsistence, so an increase in income brought genuine increases in material well-being, for example, food, shelter, health care, and this has produced more happiness. However, in a number of developed nations, levels of material well-being have moved beyond subsistence to unprecedented abundance. Developed nations have had several generations of unparalleled material prosperity, and a clear understanding is emerging, more money does bring more happiness when we are living on a very low income. However, as a global average, when per capita income reaches the range of $13,000 per year, additional income adds relatively little to our happiness, while other factors such as personal freedom, meaningful work, and social tolerance add much more. Often, a doubling or tripling of income in developed nations has not led to an increase in perceived well-being. 2. We are wired more for the struggle for survival on the savanna than we are for urban life. As a result, situations are constantly evaluated as good or bad, requiring escape or permitting approach. In everyday life, this means that our aversion to losses is naturally greater than our attraction to gain, by a factor of 2. We have an inbuilt mechanism to give priority to bad news. Our brains are set up to detect a predator in a fraction of a second, much quicker than the part of the brain that acknowledges one has been seen. That is why we can act before we even know we are acting. Threats are privileged above opportunities, Kahneman says. This natural tendency means that we overweight unlikely events, such as being caught in a terrorist attack. It also leads to us overestimating our chances of winning the lottery. 3. It is not only through our actions that we can give life meaning, insofar as we can answer life-specific questions responsibly, we can fulfill the demands of existence not only as active agents but also as loving human beings, in our loving dedication to the beautiful, the great, the good. Should I perhaps try to explain for you with some hackneyed phrase how and why experiencing beauty can make life meaningful? I prefer to confine myself to the following thought experiment. Imagine that you are sitting in a concert hall and listening to your favorite symphony, and your favorite bars of the symphony resound in your ears, and you are so moved by the music that it sends shivers down your spine, and now imagine that it would be possible for someone to ask you in this moment whether your life has meaning. I believe you would agree with me if I declared that in this case you would only be able to give one answer, and it would go something like, it would have been worth it to have lived for this moment alone. 4. The process of research is often not entirely rational. In the classical application of the scientific method, the researcher is supposed to develop a hypothesis, then design a crucial experiment to test it. If the hypothesis withstands this test a generalization is then argued for, and an advance in understanding has been made. But where did the hypothesis come from in the first place? I have a colleague whose favorite question is why is this so? And I've seen this innocent question spawn brilliant research projects on quite a few occasions. Research is a mixture of inspiration, hypothesis generation, musing over the odd and surprising, finding lines of attack on difficult problems, and rational thinking, design and execution of crucial experiments, analysis of results in terms of existing theory. Most of the books on research methods and design of experiments, there are hundreds of them, are concerned with the rational part, and fail to deal with the creative part, yet without the creative part no real research would be done, no new insights would be gained, and no new theories would be formulated.